What's going on guys? This is going to be part three of the 2014 RX PX260 project. Part one was just the overview, trying to find everything that was wrong with the ski, basically things that need to be addressed. Uh, we found that the intercooler was bad. Basically the air and water sections were no longer separated and air and water were being mixed. Uh, so when the ski was running in the water, essentially the water was making it into the air part and being sucked into the engine, which was causing fuel, oil, or just oil contamination. We got the oil swapped out so it's all fresh, and now we just need to go ahead and swap the intercooler. Part two of the series, by the way, was the uh, bilge pump install, so if you want to check that out, feel free. Um, but we're going to go ahead and replace the intercooler in this project. If you guys are curious to know how we find if an intercooler is bad, just reference part one. I go over the process for it. Uh, but that's, you know, that's what that is. So for you guys that are curious, the older skis actually have the inner or the uh, exhaust resonator off to the side. Uh, generally, uh, I forget what year they switched, but for the most part, the resonator kind of sits in the back just in this section here. Uh, but on this particular year and model, the resonator was off to the side and the intercooler sits in the middle. If you have a newer ski, it's kind of the other way around. Either way, the process to get it out is quite similar. We really just need to remove the exhaust crossover hose, and then we have the two charge pipes for the intercooler uh, that go into the throttle body and the supercharger, but we'll go ahead and get those out in a second. This is the intercooler that I'm going with. Uh, this is the WSM, interco WSM intercooler uh, model 010-7000K. Now, I know a lot of people are gonna say, why would you use an aftermarket intercooler? Why not go with an OEM, blah, blah, blah. Uh, the simple fact of the matter is, is that intercoolers for this model are kind of hard to come by in uh, the OEM intercoolers uh, because they don't make them anymore. So if you wanted to go with an OEM intercooler, you're kind of stuck with a used one uh, that you can find online on auction sites, eBay, Facebook Marketplace, whatever. Uh, but there's no real good way to kind of verify that you're getting a good intercooler and even if you do get a good intercooler, it's still a used one, so you don't know how much life is left on it. And there are some better intercoolers. You have the Fizzle, you have Riva, um, but you know, for the cost, uh, this again is a project ski. It's a 11 year old ski with 160 hours, 150 hours, I forget. Uh, I'm not putting a thousand dollar intercooler in this thing. Um, an aftermarket WSM, I've used WSM parts in the past and I've never had any problems. If it does end up causing any problem, you know, I work on these things, I have no problem swapping it out for a different one. Uh, but like I said, I've used WSM for many years uh, on various skis and have never had any problems with any of their parts. So I'm going to go ahead and get this thing taken out and I'll kind of give you a walkthrough of it. All right, so I want to explain this intercooler because a lot of these aftermarket intercoolers come with a bunch of different hoses and it can be confusing for people, uh, which it is because some intercoolers, including this one, are adding an additional step, which isn't really needed. So we have the uh, air charge pipes. These are the air side. So one is going to be where your air is going in from or it's being supplied into the throttle body and one's being from the supercharger. It's cooling down the hot air. Uh, that's the air side. The water side, uh, this always kind of confuses people. So the intercooler is going to be sitting in the ski like this. You have your vent line, which is always going to be on the top side. Uh, and then we have, and that's the vent line. I'll explain that in a second. And then we have two water feeds here on the back side. So <clears throat> the way the system works is we have raw water, which is being sent in, and that's always going to be on the bottom fitting here. That way the intercooler can fill up with water and allow all the air to escape. If we let the water come in through the top side, that can kind of fill with water, but not fully, and you'll have some air gaps, and it just leads to inefficiency. So we're always going to fill from the bottom, bottom side, and you'll see that um, when we get to the ski. So the water that's coming out of the jet pump, going through the engine, whatever, um, the feed coming off of the jet pump is going to go through our bottom port here. The top port is the exit, so that's where it's going to enter back into the cooling loop. On the front here, we have our vent line uh, and this is what goes to the intercooler telltale on the back of the ski which is right here and that is basically you know when you're running the ski in the water or on the hose 
and you see water coming out of there, that is the intercooler telltale. It just means that the intercooler has water in it and is being pumped. Uh, if you don't see water coming out of there, that means there's something wrong. So generally when you see water coming out of here, that means there is one, the water flow, but two, all of the air in the system uh, on the water side is removed, which is a good thing. The part that gets confusing is the aftermarket intercoolers that give you these flush hoses. So basically the mindset is that you are going to put a T fitting on here. So in line with the intercooler vent line, you will also have a T fitting that goes on and then you're going to add this flush line which you'll connect to that hose. Uh, that way you can flush the intercooler separate of the ski. Now, is that needed? No, not really, because you are actually, you're still sending water through the system whenever you flush the ski. Uh, this line, this line, and this line are all connected. If you blow through here, you will f hear air or water coming out of the other ports. So, in factory form, you are still flushing the intercooler anytime you use the flush port on the back. The intercooler feed line comes right off of this hose here. So we have a line that goes in for the manifold, the exhaust manifold, which is cooling the exhaust, and we also have a T-fitting that goes to the intercooler through this inlet port right here. So if you're riding in salt water and you come back to shore and you run your salt away, that is actually getting pumped through the intercooler. Some aftermarket manufacturers don't want you to take any risk, so they also want you to flush your intercooler with a dedicated feed line. Now, the problem with this dedicated feed line is that it throws people off and they think that they are only flushing the intercooler. So they will, uh, you know, after they flush the ski, whatever, they shut the engine off. Now they go to feed water into the intercooler or the salt away, whatever. But like I said, you are still connected to the cooling loop, the OEM cooling loop, which does get fed back into the exhaust manifold. So if you are sitting there and you're flushing the intercooler, you're actually still sending water through the cooling loop. You're just sending it through a different fitting. So instead of flushing it through the back, now you're flushing it through the front. And what that means is, say you're flushing this thing for five minutes, you are actually sending water through the exhaust loop, which can then back feed into the engine. Essentially, running the hose on this thing through the feed line they give you is the exact same as running water through the OEM flush port right here. Um, and there's probably been three or four instances this year alone uh, where people brought me their skis with this exact setup and said they flushed their intercooler just like they were supposed to and then the next time they took it out something didn't feel right with the ski and sure enough the engine is full of water for that exact reason so <clears throat> if you purchase an aftermarket intercooler disregard those things you do not need them i promise you uh, the instructions will tell you that it's critical that you have to flush it and yes while that is true using the oem flush loop is perfectly sufficient you're not gaining anything by using these flush connectors right here so realistically all we are going to be doing is removing the oem intercooler and then plopping this in place, putting all the OEM connections exactly back where they were. So we have the vent line, which is gonna go on here. We'll have the water inlet that goes onto this connection, and then we have the outlet that goes onto this connection. And by the way, this is a anode. Some aftermarket intercoolers will just put a plug here and not have any anode on the intercooler at all. This one is an anode. Uh, we can tell it's obviously very new looking. Uh, so we are good to go there. So, uh, by the way, guys, if you are looking for an intercooler um, and you're looking on Amazon and it doesn't really have a name or the intercooler is only like 140 bucks or something like that, I can assure you that is going to be a very poor choice in intercooler. These things are not cheap to produce. Uh, so if you are getting a quality intercooler, that's not going to give you problems. It's going to be at least three, four hundred dollars um, This one was just under $400. Another problem I see with a lot of the cheap intercoolers is that they leave, it's basically a cast intercooler, uh, and then there's gonna be some casting material left inside. Worst case, it's on the air side because now you are sending sand or metal bits into your engine best case it's on the water side and it just gets rinsed out through the flush cycle but uh you do not want to cheap out with this thing i know it's an easy one where you say well all it does is cool the intake air uh 
in a sense, yes, that's all it's doing, but there's a lot of tight channels in here, and if it leaks any water at all uh, into the Airstream, you're going to be in for a world of problems, especially if you don't know what you're doing. Uh, but then again, you know, just like I said, you really need to take into consideration that most of the cheap ones that are like $100, $150 uh, are just cast intercoolers. So you really need to worry about that sand and metal stuff making it out through your intake stream. All right, so all that aside, let's go ahead and get to the replacement. Um, now, when you're looking at this, if you don't know what you're doing or if it's your first time doing anything kind of truly mechanical, it may look intimidating. You have parts, hoses, and stuff like that everywhere. I can assure you it is really not that difficult. So the first thing I'm going to do is remove this hose clamp here, just kind of loosen it up to get the exhaust crossover hose out of the way. We don't need to remove the resonator side. We can leave that on. It's a hose, it's flexible. So I'm just gonna remove it and we'll just push it to the side. With the crossover connection out of the way, I'm gonna go ahead and loosen the vent line, which you can see on the front of the intercooler right there. Uh, just a small, you can use a flathead to get that off. Just loosen the hose clamp and push it to the side. All right, next we need to remove the two charge pipes. Now you could do this one of two ways. You can either do it from the front side here, so I can remove it from the supercharger, uh, and the other side remove from the uh, throttle body. I'm going to remove it from the intercooler. That way the placement is kind of correct. Otherwise, when you put it back, you kind of have to tilt the pipe to get them correct. So uh, I'm gonna remove the two hose clamps from our intercooler. One on that side and one just over here. Both charge pipes are removed, so we could just go ahead and remove those two rubber straps that are holding the intercooler down. Now, of course, we have the two water lines on the right-hand side of the intercooler that we can't really get to. So all we need to do is remove the straps, pull the intercooler forward slightly, just this way, and then we'll have easier access to the hoses at the back. All right, I know the GoPro doesn't pick it up too well, but you have much easier access to those rear two hoses uh, with the intercooler moved up a little bit. So I'm gonna go ahead and remove those. And then once we pull those hoses off, the intercooler is completely free, so we can go ahead and remove it from the ski. All right, here's the old intercooler compared to the new. And I just wanted to show you this. So if you look inside, you can see all those fins. That's essentially what's creating the difference. Um, if you look at the, the metal going side to side, those are the radiating fins that are dissipating the heat uh, or allowing you to transfer the heat from the air to the water. And if you look at those vertical strips, those are the channels that the water passes through. Uh, so that's what I mean when I say these things are very, very tight clearance on the inside. And if any one of those channels cracks, that's where you're going to pass water into the intake stream. So we have all those vertical things uh, with water passing through them, you basically send water from the bottom and it'll pass up through and it kind of does a bunch of loops. So it'll go up and down and up and down. Um, and if any one of those even has a pinhole leak, just a very, very, very small leak, that's all it takes for it to uh, dump a bunch of water through the intake and now your water, your engine is sucking that in. Um, and that can happen for a variety of reasons. It could be pitted and corroded and the water pressure, air pressure is all it takes to pop a leak. Uh, or even more common is the intercoolers, uh, people winter, you know, they don't winterize them. They park them for the winter. There's a small, water, small amount of water that's left in the intercooler. That water freezes, expands, cracks the water jacket. And now when you ride the ski in spring, uh, all you do is suck in water. Generally, you can kind of tell uh, this one I can't, so I'm not sure if that's the problem or not, but if you look at the very side profile of the intercooler, sometimes you can see a bulge out, uh, and that's kind of where it cracks. If it's an internal, like one of the more middle fins, you're obviously not gonna see any bulging. Uh, that's more of like a catastrophic kind of failure, but uh, either way, that's that's pretty much it for this. So we know this intercooler is bad. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and put the new intercooler in. All right, and just like every other time I do intercooler work, I'm going to spray the pad that the intercooler sits on with some anti-corrosive lubricant. When we have the intercooler in here, obviously uh, that pad back there, the shelf that it sits on, is not going to get the rinsing that we would normally have when we are you know, spraying this ski down after saltwater rides. So easiest thing to do is just kind of spray the whole area with anti-corrosion. 
and it just gives the intercooler a fighting chance when it's sitting on there because it's not sitting on a dry spot that may at some point have salt water sitting under there because once salt water gets underneath the intercooler between the intercooler and the shelf that it sits on it's basically just going to sit there it will not dry out and even when it does you're just leaving a salt surface um, so a lot of intercooler failures if they're not internal you will see external breaches uh, and that's pretty much what causes it. It just sits on a salt shelf and never actually gets any uh, flushing. So, you know, at least to spray something on there to give it a fighting chance. But uh, that's it for that. So let's go ahead and put this in the ski. All right, so before we batten down the intercooler or do anything, we wanna go ahead and get those rear hoses on because they are the hardest to get to. So we'll reattach those and then we can push the intercooler back to get the straps on. With those back two hoses in, we can go ahead and push the intercooler into place and put our two rubber straps on. All right, guys, we're getting close to the end. All we need to do is go ahead and reattach our charge pipes and of course put the exhaust crossover pipe back on. I'm gonna do that right now and then what we're gonna do is another boost leak test just to verify that this intercooler uh, is 100%. There's no problems with it. So let me go ahead and get the pipes back and then we'll move on to the test. And just like that, all of our charge pipes and the exhaust crossover cable are good to go. So I'm gonna go ahead and reattach our boost leak tester that we used on the last video, or the very first video. Uh, we'll get this coupled on to the supercharger inlet and um, I'll stage the compressor, we'll get the test ready. All right, tester's hooked up, we have our hose connected. I just filled the compressor, so let's go ahead and slowly start to fill it. I'm just gonna put a small amount in. Now remember from part one, this was leaking almost immediately. So we'll put about, set that to 10. And yeah, that's going past 10, let me slow it down. Okay. That's about 12 PSI and it's holding. There's no leaks at all. And if you remember, it was leaking out of our flush port and it is whisper quiet there. So intercooler fixed it. We just had a bad intercooler. Not sure if it was a defect from the factory, if it just froze over winter, or if there was just corrosion. Actually, I'll pull off the anode. We'll take a look at that and see what that looks like. But that fixed our problem. So I'm not sure uh, if the performance was affected by this or not. Generally, when your intercooler is leaking water and you're sucking it in, your performance is severely limited. Normally, you can only get to 30, 40 miles an hour, sometimes more, sometimes less, uh, but you definitely will contaminate your oil. So that problem is now fixed. So move on to the next part, but uh, real quick, I'm curious, I'm gonna pull that anode and we'll take a look at that. Okay, so this anode looks brand new. And by the way, I'm not sure if I mentioned it in the first video, but this intercooler is actually, uh, I don't even think it's a year old. So that just kind of goes to show, I'm, I'm leaning towards this was freeze damage. Uh, and that just kind of goes to show that it doesn't matter how old your intercooler is, you can uh, break it if it freezes. Uh, I've even seen brand new skis where uh, the person bought it from the dealership, where the dealership did a test with it. They just kind of connected to the hose or whatever for their PDI, post delivery inspection. Uh, the owner brings it home and they think, well, it's brand new, I don't have to winterize it. And sure enough, when they, when spring comes around, they start the ski and they wonder why their oil has water in it and why performance is all kind of messed up. And that can do it. Uh, this kind of just goes to show why winterizing is a critical thing that you cannot skip on. Uh, but either way, the intercooler is replaced. We're good to go. I'm gonna go ahead and get the tester off. And then uh, that's that's it for this. This is project three, or project part three, intercooler replacement on a 2014 SeaDoo RXPX 2060. If you guys have any questions about doing a intercooler replacement on your own ski, or just questions in general, whatever, uh, leave a comment or send me an email. I will be happy to get back to you. I mentioned in another video where uh, I am getting a crazy amount of messages and emails, things like that. Um, don't forget guys, this is not my full-time job. Obviously, I just work on skis on the side. I do have a full-time day job, uh, so I cannot me answer messages all day long. Um, and you know, I've been getting a crazy amount of messages since the beginning of the year. So, uh, if I don't respond to you right away, just give me some time, a couple days or whatever, but I will absolutely do my best to get back to you. Other than that, that is it for this video.